Officer down! I repeat, officer down! Welcome back to 1033. This is your host, Nathan Kapler. A podcast created for a first responder by a first responder. If you are not a first responder, you still are welcome. This podcast is aimed directly at trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder. PTSD is complex and often misunderstood. Our brave men and women who serve our communities often end up with behavioral and psychological issues as a result of experienced trauma from their careers. My goal is to share what I know my personal experience with PTSD as a retired police officer and continue to advocate for mental health while providing support to those still in their careers. This podcast is not a substitute for professional medical help and I strongly suggest if you are in fact suffering, you seek out professional medical advice. Please join me on this episode as I continue to expose the reality of PTSD challenges. I hope you enjoy this week's episode. Welcome back to 1033. This is your host, Nathan Kapler, and today I'm joined by Chance Burles. Chance Burles comes to us from Edmonton, Alberta. He has over eight years of military experience. He was in the military from 2005 to 2013. Chance then retired and realized that he had something to deal with, post-traumatic stress. Now, in his journey of recovering and healing, he has grown immensely and where he stands today is very different from where he stood in the past chance welcome to the show it's an honor to have you brother thanks for having me man this is awesome (laughs) yeah right so it it like i connect with tons of people now through social media social media is the best little tool out there Mm -hmm. to help uh, us all connect that's how you and i connected and we were both kind of banging the same drum on different ends of the spectrum i'm out in bc you're out in alberta and I was like, right on. This guy's a rock star. He gets it. He understands how you deal with PTSD. You can't hide from it. You can't not talk about it. You've got to talk about it. And you've got to try to figure out how to have compassion for people, yourself. And how do you do this, right? Because at one point in the journey, like we were both unwell. Mm-hmm. But before we dive into what that looks like, tell me a little bit about you before military. What did you look like? What did your life look like? Uh, it was very different than nowadays. So uh, I grew up all over Southern Alberta. Um, my parents didn't have, a, didn't have a whole lot of money and we were renting. So we would move from area to area over time. I, I did the math the other day and before I left for the army, I think we moved seven or eight times from that I can recall, like being... Uh, I think I was three or four, maybe. Anyway, doesn't matter. Uh, it was a lot. And we went from like Lethbridge to um, Calgary to Nanton, Pincher Creek. Um, I was in Madison Hat for a little while. Like I'm, I was all over Southern Alberta. And uh, my my mom, <laughs> on my mom's side, she is a straight up hippie, like straight up hippie, uh, like hitchhiking across the states in the 60s kind of, <laughs> kind of deal. And my dad and his whole side of the family are all ranchers and cowboys. And uh, my dad is like a singer uh, as well as a musician and mechanic and whatever. And, 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 and. anyway, so growing up was weird. They got, uh, they got divorced when I was three. Um, and we had uh, my stepdad who I've known basically my whole life um, stepped in and has been taking care of since then. But yeah, I moved around a lot and just hanging out with my mom and going back to the ranch every once in a while and hanging out with my mom. And uh, it was it was challenging because we didn't have a lot of money. And I was apparently humongous. I didn't think I was that tall. But by the time I was, uh, I went from being the, I think I was like the third or fourth tallest kid in my class. Over a summer, I came back and I was the second tallest kid in school. And so I yeah, did lots of sports, um, lots of track was my big one. I loved uh, running and jumping and we got to throw discuses around and like it was ideal for me. <laughs> Anything I can do to uh, be physical. The, the thing I struggled with actually throughout my entire life, up even through the military, was anger. And I had no real understanding of how to deal with it other than physically. 
so that's where all the sports came in right i love that was how i got out all that extra pressure and tried to do something physical the problem was when i wasn't doing that i was mm, smashing my knuckles on you know fence posts and taking my anger out or let it build and then i would fucking lash out at stuff and it was it was bad uh eventually though throughout all that time i was a very chill happy go lucky hey you want to do this hey you want to do that let's go have fun i was taking it very day by day so it was never uh any plans except for one which was to be in the army <laughs> and i have a picture of myself when i was four out in the country and uh I was wearing like an OD shirt, kind of like this. And it said army in the stencil, old school stencil, right? And uh, a picture of myself standing sentry on top of a tree house with a pop gun for no other reason than because I was thought it was supposed to. Uh, and yeah, I wanted to be in the army the, my whole life. And then finally, uh, I was a little older. I think I was like 21 at the time. And I was talking to my brother who was in Korea teaching English. And I just lost another crappy job i think it was at a liquor store somewhere and i was telling him like oh i don't know what i'm gonna do maybe just get another job and he was like why haven't you joined the army yet and i was like well i don't know what are we gonna do blah 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 and then uh he was just like no shut the fuck up and just go down and do it man like just just go down there and do that and i was like that's a good idea that's a that's a good idea. And so the next day I went down and <laughs> I applied. Um, and I had a very interesting first application, which was uh, I did my substance use form. And again, my mom was a hippie, right? So I got uh, exposed to a lot of recreational drugs, <laughs> not in a bad way, but it was just kind of in the culture. And uh, so I'd been a bit of a pothead growing through high school, did some mushrooms and all, you know, all the fun stuff. And so I was honest in my substance use form, <laughs> which was different than most people were. And uh, I wrote down that I had done some mushrooms at one point and I couldn't remember how long it had been. So I was like, ah, year and a half. Yeah, sure, 18 months, that should be fine, right? And then I handed it to the uh, recruiter and she was like, oh, yeah. So you need to have three years separation from any sort of psychoactive drugs before you sign up. And I was like, what and they're like yeah you have to come back in 18 months and i was like fuck i was so pissed off and and then i was like you know what fine 18 months it is and it i look back on it now as such a such a blessing because it gave me 18 months to like focus and that's where i found my like okay you want to work i can work <laughs> so like i went back the night uh went home woke up the next day threw on a backpack with weight and i started rocking and then I started running that next day. And then I started, uh, you know, just trying to up my skills, up my physical ability, start doing more exercises. Um, and 18 months later, I showed up the recruiting office and I was like, boom, here's my application. I'm back. You ready for this? And they're like, I have no idea who you are. <laughs> it was an entirely different crew. <laughs> they had all been posted out and in and out. And I was like, well, whatever. And yeah, joined the army from there. It's good times. <laughs> How old were you then when you joined? Uh, the first time I was 21, 20, yeah, no, 20, 22. And then I, I got in, I was 23. Still, still very young in the grand scheme of things. Um, well, so yeah, you obviously had. When I showed up to basic, I was the old man. Right. I was surrounded by 17, 18 year olds, <laughs> 23 year old. And they were like, whoa, you're fucking old. <laughs> Yeah, that's, and that's the interesting thing, right, with that environment is even at 23, uh, you're probably surrounded by 19-year-olds, 20-year-olds, and that's a big gap at that age. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> but it was fun. What, um, what was life like once you joined the military? Well, this was a, I got the, I got the dream. The, the, the thing that most people don't realize is that there's a shit ton of waiting in the military. So you have to wait for courses. You got to wait for enough people to go on that course from the deep. Like, so as you go to basic, 
before you even go there, you have to wait until they have a class. They have enough people to make a class. And then they call you and say, okay, this class is going to be starting at this point in time. This is when you can show up. So there's a gap. Like I always thought you walk down to the recruiting office, you put your paperwork in, they're like, okay, get on the bus. Right. <laughs> and you just go. Um, but it doesn't actually work that way. So once I got in, I started basic. I started basic in a January of 05, 06, January of 06. And I did that. And this is, so we're already in Afghanistan, right? January of 06, we get the, not January, but in 06, we get the new area of Kandahar. So everyone just comes down from Kabul and Aunt Medusa starts <laughs> while I'm in training. So I go from my basic to my SQ to my threes course. And I remember being on my threes course, getting casualty updates um, of guys that were lost, guys that were wounded during Aunt Medusa. And all our instructors are going like, understand that this is where you're going. This isn't like, it's not a peacekeeping mission. You're going to war and you need to like be right with that ahead of time. And that helped us immeasurably because again, focus, right? It was always, okay, now we need to be a hundred percent on all of our drills. We need to be that much better because that's where we're going. Uh, but yeah, I did that January basic SQ and then my threes. And I was in my unit by October of that year. And so it was bang, 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 get to my unit. We did a, a, a reorg for stand up for tour in the January. So I'd been in my unit for like two months. I got stood up for tour right away. We did all of 07 as workup. And then I left in February of 08. And then I was there for most of the year. And then I got back in October of 08. So it was just like training, 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 unit, training, 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 tour, 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 tour home. And uh, that was my entrance into the military. <laughs> it was very quick, very uh, learning by fire hose and just trying to yeah, make it through the day well, for a lot of it. Hearing about the casualties, the injuries of the brothers and sisters that are over in knowing that you two are going to be going over you you talked a little bit about how you were able to focus and really bring that perspective in and harness it and use it as a strength to get ready because you knew where you were going. What was it like in that moment, though? Were there moments of fear, anxiety, knowing that you were now going into this environment where your life will, could be potentially put on the line? Uh, not really. It was there was a lot of faith in the confidence of our instructors. So the people that were training us at the school, they were like, they knew the people that were over there, right? This isn't that they were like, uh, you know, separated from it in any way. These guys are people that they served with and <laughs> it was that they've been serving with for multiple years already. And, uh, and so they, they were adamant. They were like, I will not put you in a position where you will fail over there. So they were very confident in their training. And, uh, and the other part was that they really pushed us to like, you have to want to be better. And one of the things I got told during, I don't know how many numerable times we were looking at a minefield was like, think about how you would kill you. How would someone with your skill and your training and your experience kill you. And so it made us look at it from the opposite, right? We weren't just looking for bombs. We were looking for areas that we would use to get the enemy. And they were like, oh, and so it, it just changed the, the game a little bit. And you know, when you're young, you're 19, 20, it's not going to happen to you, right? <laughs> It's not you. You're going to go there. You're going to be fine. Everyone's going to be like, sure, sure. Shit's going to happen. But you never really believe that it's you. Even though you, you know, it could be you, you never really believe it. <laughs> and then until you're over there and then it's a whole other ball game. But uh, yeah, the, the training, it, it never really bothered us. Some people, it, I saw it bother some people, but 
yeah, personally, it was just more of a recognition, like, okay, do it better, be stronger, be faster, be more knowledgeable, be um, better skilled at detection, that kind of stuff. So it didn't actually impact you all that much prior to going because you had the faith in the instructors and you knew the system uh, that was behind you should look out for, for you, for your well being. Yeah. When did that shift? When did things suddenly shift into, okay, now here is a taste of fear or did you experience a moment like that now over in, in Afghanistan when you did your tour, when did you first experience that moment? Uh, well, there was actually a couple, uh, the first one we were in, I pretty sure it was, we were in Wainwright. We had like, we were in Wainwright all the time. So <laughs> we were training in Wainwright and, uh, I got, we were in a tracked lab, like an M113 kind of deal, like the old school box one. And we were driving around and I was out, popped out of the family hatch with a machine gun and, uh, and a rope that I had kind of finagled off of the the top of the t-lab so i was basically bull riding slash surfing on the t-lab with a machine gun up as air century and uh we hit a hard we went down a hill turned left hard and i got thrown out of the vehicle um and the only thing that was holding me on was the one hand that i had uh strapped <laughs> tied basically to the uh, the T-Lav and somebody who had my feet and I was hanging over the side and I was staring at the tracks like rip right past my face and I just like shit <laughs> and it was one of those moments of like this could all end right now right if somebody hadn't grabbed your feet it's over and I was like okay okay like maybe I shouldn't be so crazy as to try and surf slash bull ride <laughs> the friggin' t lab uh and then an, another situation again in wainwright we were in a lab 25 this time uh with the 25 mil turret and i was in the air century hatch out the back again with my machine gun i was a machine gunner and uh the gunner had fallen asleep with the barrel pointed to the nine o'clock so it was off to my right and uh as we were driving the barrel hit sequence of like two or three trees and like cut them in half of big long tall trees and so i see these trees coming at me and they bounce off the hull and i'm like holy crap like again that could have ended me right there uh but it woke the gunner up and the gunner immediately squeezed on the palm switch to rotate the barrel but the trees had done some damage to the uh, inhibiting system and it thought it was in a lockout zone so it tried to swing the barrel automatically and the thing came back and like and it pinned me pinned my machine gun me to the top of the air sentry hatch so i was like a hair away from being cut in half again like that uh and we stopped and it kind of like jiggled me and then i was able to fall down into the hole and i was good to go that was just before getting there. <laughs> and then uh, my first operation going overseas, we found an IED, uh, a pretty big one uh, by happenstance. And uh, there's a bit of an interesting story to this. I'm sorry for going on this long diatribe about <laughs> near death experiences here, but um, so this is a huge operation. We had tanks, we had, basically an entire company of infantry, the whole uh, squadron or whole troop of engineers, like we were, it was a big, big deal. And uh, we were roll, we were rolling along, but it because we were new, like we had been in country maybe two and a half weeks, three weeks, like we were new. And so every culvert, every bend of the road, every hilltop, anything that was suspicious, they were like, the engineers have to go out. So we started we were basically walking for the first like 10, 15 kilometers of that were just like constantly clearing, constantly clearing. And the infantry captain was, um, or I think maybe, maybe the major, he was telling us to go faster. Like you need to clear faster. We have to get there. You have to clear faster. And we're already going like, this is dangerously fast as it is. If you want to fucking, my sergeant was like, if you want to go faster, you send your troops to fucking do it. And so 
he did. The infantry guys ran right up there to the next one. They checked this culvert. They said it was good. They jumped back in the vehicle. Tank rolls, second tank rolls, and everyone stops. And uh, the tank is, the tanks are telling us there's wires sticking out of the ground. Why are there wires sticking out of the ground? And so the lead engineer, their lead infantry vehicle calls up the engineers and me and my master corporal go running out there and we're like, what do you mean wires? I don't see any wires. And the, the tanks are yelling at us saying, it's on the right side of the road. It's on the right side of the road. And so me and my master corporal are looking on the right side of the road and we're like, I don't see any of this. But they're facing backwards. <laughs> right? So we're listening to it on the radio saying it's on the right side of the road, but they're looking at us. So it's their right, our left. It was just a bit of a shit show. So then we see the wires. I'm like, okay, wires. And we trace the wires back to a battery pack off the, just off the side of the culvert. And I'm like, you gotta be fine. Like it was obvious just sitting there. And so my mass corporal goes to look at that. And then I'm sitting there looking at the break in the wires. And I see these things kind of like dolphin in and out of the dirt every so often. And I follow it back to the pressure plate in the middle of the road. And what had happened was the tank tracks were wider than the vehicle tracks. So the pressure plate wasn't long enough or wide enough. So the tracks bridged it and then they cut the wire as they ran over it. And I'm standing there looking at the pressure plate and I'm like, that's my fucking boot print, like pressure plate, boot print. And I was like, shit. Again, just like, you know, a matter of half an inch, three quarters of an inch. Now, with the wires cut, I it wouldn't have done anything at the time, right? But there were lots of secondaries and stuff later on in the tour that that would have been an issue. But that's, you know, at the time it was just like, holy shit, that was close to my foot that I would, would that I had been wandering around looking for the wire on the wrong side of the road, right? <laughs> it had been part of my blueprint. So those those three points kind of like again they just hammered it home. Like you need to be careful but also understand that even if you are careful and you're doing everything right it's war and you just kind of go okay yep i guess it is and you just start going you know every day becomes a hey i'm alive sweet what do we got to do right and you just let it wash over you and then move on it was interesting time though one one thing that like for me as a police, a former police officer, I'm retired now, uh, I can definitely recall all the different traumatic events that I went through and the emotional range that the human body goes through during these traumatic events. For you in those moments, Chance, like what were you recognizing was kind of surfacing as the emotions, uh, the dominant emotions that were surfacing in these moments of, okay, my boot was just next to the plate or I just about got taken out by the uh, the gun turret or just about fell off the lav and got eaten up by the tracks. Like what was happening in the body and were they the same experience, the same emotional experiences at the same time? Looking back on it, probably, yeah. I, I think the word that I would use is surprise. <laughs> that was the biggest one. Um, and I think, because like I was saying earlier, right? Like you never really think it's going to be you. You never really believe that uh, until it is you. And, you know, again, one of my sergeants uh, said early on, he was like, it's not a question of if we get blown up at this point in time, like where were we in 2008, there were fucking IEDs everywhere. Um, and he was like, it's not a question of if it's just when and how bad. And we were always like, yeah, yeah, that's kind of where we are. Um, and even when we did get blown up, we got lucky and we hit a small one and it only blew a couple tires off and everyone was okay. I mean, it messed up my back a little bit, but, um, at the time I didn't know of it and it was just like, a, oh, okay, well, fuck, we got lucky on that one. <laughs> All right. Uh, but yeah, the, the biggest one was surprise for quite a bit until I'd say after that first IED where I'd like, that was kind of the last time where I was actually surprised by it. And then from then on, it was just like a, yep. Okay. Another day in Kandahar. The interesting thing too, even from my own 
perspective is I can recall when I first became a Mountie and having to go some real, do some very serious uh, traumatic calls or calls that ended up being very filled with trauma, the fear or the anxiety or the gut wrenching, how is this going to go? Am I going to be okay? Was always there. And I actually quickly learned that that feeling actually was very difficult to deal with at Mm -hmm. the same time of having to go and deal with a call. So for me, I actually started to kind of push some of those emotions down a little bit to try and like get rid of the fear because sometimes you don't even have time to feel fear. Absolutely. Yeah. Like the, like the first firefight I got into, I, I didn't even realize what was like what I was doing. I didn't like cognitively realize what I was doing you know, the training kicks in, right? You just go there. Oh, they're shooting. Okay. We're going to shoot back. Oh, we're going to, sh- we're going to shoot back for a while. Okay. Now we're, now we're, everyone's done shooting. Okay. Everyone's done shooting. Okay. We're good. Right. Like you're just, um, and then you start to process it and then you start going, Whoa, wait, wait, Whoa. I reloaded my, like, when did I reload? Oh shit. Okay. Like they're, in those initial incidences until you get so used to the stress inoculation, you get so inoculated to the stress that you can then start functioning in it. And I mean, that's what our training does, right? Like that's what it attempts to do is it's what it's supposed to do is get you to a point that you can think under the stress. And yeah, after the the first firefight that day, like the first one was, Oh God. And then afterwards you're like, okay, like I, I have a better understanding of this. And then the next one or subsequent next one, you start, you, that peak comes down a little bit and it's actually, I, it's, it's interesting because it's the same thing that you want to avoid later on post-traumatic stress and depression, right? You want to avoid those peaks. So you got to learn tools in order to manage them. And same thing we do in, in just under stressful environments, right? You, If you find yourself peaked out in the middle of a stressful situation, well, okay, now you need to practice that. You need to practice it at a lesser extent and wear that peak down, right? If you, I don't know, you pull your shot, say you draw on your initial draw, you pull your shot and you're like, ah, and you, you flinch. Okay. Now we need to work on flinch control. Okay. So we're going to go to the range. We're going to, you're going to draw, you're going to drip fire draw present fire right and you're going to get used to it and then you're going to have start adding in like dummy rounds so that you know when you flinch and then like and you just break it down into smaller and smaller pieces so the same thing that we did overseas the same things that we did in training they're actually the same tools that we're using <laughs> afterwards in the healing process too it's crazy And again, like even just echo and build on kind of where we're at, like I think for me too, even in my own experience, there were points where I was riddled with fear going to a call. I then learned how to suppress the fear, do the call, let the training kick in. And that's the wonderful thing about training is really like it will let you deal with very complicated scenarios and situations on the fly. Mm Mm-hmm. But you've also got to be able to come back afterwards and try to process some of those emotions that were there that you maybe ignored and tried to push through. Uh, And that's, I mean, is that where PTSD starts to grow? I mean, I don't know. I'm not a psychologist, but it's definitely not a human way of dealing with trauma. We're very emotional human beings. Uh, We need to experience emotion in the moment in order to be able to help it get processed. Uh, and when you kind of circumvent that process, and we have to as a first responder in order to deal with the situation or the task at hand, it just kind of muddies the water. And we we actually, as men or women, oftentimes struggle to go back to that emotion later and even process it then, or we just say, oh, we don't need to because we didn't really experience it. Uh, which is, it's such a complicated world. And I think too, even just to like push the conversation even further, like there was definitely times too in my own career where now all of a sudden I'm feeling like I'm untouchable and the ego is kicking in and I'm like, yeah, I don't need to be safe anymore. I'm invincible. No way am I going to get hurt in the line of duty, right? And like started to do a few risky things as a police officer where normally if I was, you know, naturally a very cautious human and would try to stay away from 
a risky situation. Now I'm like, oh, I'm good. I got this. Mm-hmm. Did you notice that too with your service that you all of a sudden now the ego is starting to become maybe an issue and you're not arrogant, but you know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. yeah. It, uh, Satch and I were talking about this too, is that there's a, I use the word complacency, but it's not really a complacency. It's a, there's a level of competence that you reach that you start using shortcuts because you're, you're fully competent in, in the, um, in the fundamentals of something, but you also know there's some there's a way to streamline it just a little bit better for you. Right. And you're like, Oh, okay. And so you make a little shortcut, right? I, instead of, uh, instead of taking the time to take my finger off the trigger on my machine gun, when I drop a box off it, well, I know I'm not going to, I know I'm not going to pull the trigger. Right. And even if I do, there's no box on it. So who the fuck cares? Right. But it's those little moments, it's those moments that that level of complacency kicks in and you have to be able to live with a certain amount, right? It's risk management, right? Am I comfortable with this risk? Am I not? Um, and when you get that level of con, you get to a le- certain level of competence and you think, absolutely, I am okay with this risk. It's worked before. I've been able to like, da, 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 I've been able to do it. And what you're doing is you're lying to yourself because sure, it might've worked in the past, but that's an outlier, right? <laughs> that's, there's a reason that these things are set up these way, this way. And, you know, you look at special forces guys, those are the dudes that they have worked that process out to a point that they've gotten to a competence level where they're like, yeah, okay. I think I, I think I know some shit. I think I'm good to go. And then they get humbled and they're like, oh, right. Okay. <laughs> but th- that's all done in training to make sure that that doesn't get there. And for, um, you know, when you don't have that understanding initially, you have to be humbled in order to kind of break that. And, yeah, it there's it does creep in quite a bit, and yeah, there's uh, but you also kind of need it. This is the other part of it. Like, so I got asked at one point in time. I was in the I was leading a section or leading a platoon of infantry through an area, um, and I was clearing along the way, and we're like, no, no, no. we get to our position. It's the middle of the night, and the infantry captain comes up to me. and He goes, "Can you clear that building?" And I was like. I was a sapper. I'd been in the army for like a year and a half at that point in time. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Okay. I can clear it. And I, and I did, I grabbed my fire team partner. I'm like, we're going to clear this building. Now, again, for an engineer, when you say clear the building, that means clear it for IEDs. If you tell an infantry man to clear a building, he's going to storm in there and try and like broom clearance. Right. You tell a tanker to clear a building, he'll shoot a fucking 125 mil round into it and be like, it's clear. Right. <laughs> So me and my fire team partner went in, we cleared it. It's good to go. I went back to the captain with a hundred percent confidence and say, good to go, sir. Now, was I a hundred percent confident at the time? Yeah. That I, I was confident in my skill set. but was I overstating my ability a little bit? Yeah. Was I anxious about doing it a little bit? Yeah. So you have to have a, like a level of bravado because if I didn't, and that captain goes, can you clear that? And I'm like, "Mm, you know, maybe I should go ask my sergeant. He's never going to ask me anything again. He's never, and he's not going to trust me to be in the front. So he's got to know that I'm perfectly competent and confident in my own competence. Let me put it that way. (laughs) So you kind of need it, but again, there's got to be a level where you go, no, I'm not confident in that. Let's go get a team member. Like there's, That's over time I've learned that, but, uh, when you're new (laughs) or you don't get taught that otherwise, uh, yeah, the, there's a level of bravado, I guess, that kind of takes over and you start to puff your chest out and stuff. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a hard lesson to learn. 
There is no right or wrong way in this journey of learning these very valuable lessons. Uh, I would actually argue that for all of us, it, again, if this is a very human experience, we're going to make mistakes along the way. But being able to reflect on, okay, you know what, I've had too much of an ego in this situation, or I, you know, I haven't really honored my own safety or whatever the case is, and to dial it back or to push yourself forward. It's such a fine line to walk on the knife's edge 24-7. 100%. Yeah. It, it it's so is. difficult. And, and it, it has an ebb and flow to it. Mm -hmm. You're never going to be able to walk on that fence line 24 seven. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. But, the, but you got to also have awareness into where you are so that you can either pull yourself back or push yourself forward. Exactly. Well, this is what we were talking about earlier, right? The peaks and the valleys, right? You, you have to, you want to smooth those out rather than have huge peaks because and valleys because it those things kill you like you'll do something super dangerous great you might survive then you have to deal with the aftermath after that right the crash and, and absolutely like that's 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 a hard area but if you can keep this nice even flow of like oh okay that that was a little that was a little sketchy i'm gonna bring it back a little bit and then you come back and you're like okay i think i went a little overboard on the safety on that one i probably could have loosened it up and you just keep this like like you said, you got to keep a nice flow back and forth without too many spikes or huge crashes. Absolutely. What were you noticing within yourself now, now that you were doing your tour? Uh, what were some of the changes that you may have noticed along the way that now that you've been diagnosed with PTSD and you can look back, you can go, oh, okay, I might not have been aware of some of the behavioral or the personality changes that were happening during service life. But now that I look back, oh, I see kind of where some of those changes started. What did they look like, Chance? Um, that's a tough question. The, the neat thing was, I was reading on combat while I was in Afghanistan. So I was learning about all the physiological changes that happen under stress. I was learning about um, all like memory inclusion and um, um, dissociation and um, memory change, like just all, all the cool stuff that your brain does when under high stress, right? So there weren't many... I, I didn't see a lot of PTSD symptoms while I was there. It was when I got home and because, so when I first got there, I basically said, I'm to myself. I was like, uh, I was like, okay, this is it. We're here. If we make it out of this alive, cool. If not, so be it. And so, you know, close calls and um, gunfights and IEDs and all these other things never really got to me. What got to me was the idiocy of things. And I could see where it was starting to creep into because I was starting to have issues with leadership and I was starting to have issues with um, the way things were done. And yeah, it just drove me nuts because we'd, we'd clear the same fucking roads over and 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 over again to the point that anybody with half a brain could see the exact procedure every one of us would take in the event that this happened. And so near the end of tour, they were targeting engineers. And I was just like, this is, and in that's where you, in the, the changeover from 308 to 109, 309, where they started targeting, um, you know, the radio men, they started targeting the engineers. They start anybody that looked different, right? If you did something differently, you were on the watch list. And then they, you started seeing secondaries and then you started seeing tertiaries. And then you start like, it became, uh, challenging for me to look at the mission set that we were like, okay, this is what we're going to go do today and go, yeah, sure. This makes sense. It's a good idea. Yeah. All right. <laughs> where a lot of it was like, we're doing what now? Why, why are we doing this again? And they'd be like, well, this is the mission. This is what we need to do. And you're like, like, are you, are you sure about that? <laughs> and so I, yeah, that was where a lot of the, the issues started for me because I started to really have, I, I was doing stuff that I was questioning the, 
how logical it was. And yet, I like, I was still doing it. We're still going on patrol, still clearing the area, still doing all the things. But I was like, I didn't understand the why behind it anymore. And that's where things started to affect me. And then after I got home, when I saw the the way in which we were treated within the units and all this stuff afterwards, it, uh, yeah, that's when all the crash started to happen from there. And that's where the, you know, there wasn't much sleep and you're dealing with, um, but yeah, I basically long story short, I bought in to Afghanistan, right? Like I, when I got there, I was like, we're here to do a good work for the people. This is our, our whole job. Like let's make this country safe. And, uh, yeah, I found out that that was not actually the mission <laughs> over time. And that uh, that's where all the symptoms started to kick in versus the the rest of the stuff. That's what that's why I joined up. That's why I went through the training when we got told all these things about casualties and getting reports on hurt friends and stuff. We were like, all right. Like, and it, and it focused us versus freaked us out kind of deal. So. Are you aware of, uh, well, I, I know you understand trauma, but sanctuary trauma, moral injuries. Oh yeah. It sounds very much like what you're describing right now is 100%. when you were coming home, it was, you were met with the sanctuary trauma and the moral injuries behind what did I just go through? Yeah. Was I lied to? Did I have to drop my own morals in order to get the job done? Like, who am I now? Mm -hmm. Very, very difficult layers of PTSD to, recognize and now have to address yeah. for you. It sounds like when you were there, it sounds like, and I don't know if you agree with this, but it sounds like there was definitely, I don't know if it's, it was cynicism that was starting to creep up first. Was it cynicism? Cynicism? Uh, yeah, I think so. Where yeah. Yeah, it just, none, none of it made really much sense anymore. Yeah. And yeah, I, I really, by the time I left, I was like, uh, what was it? Somebody was like, how do you fix Afghanistan? And you're like, glass the place. Right. And that, that that's, was, yeah, that's, you know, that's cynicism. Yeah. Just destroy it. Wipe it off the map. Yeah. And then it's done. The fighting's over. Right. Yeah. Because. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's compassion fatigue. That's so many different things. Uh, something that I'm actually really curious that I haven't had really much of a chance to talk to people about in this was, uh, was also survivor's guilt. When did survivor's guilt step in for you? That was, uh, that was pretty early. Um, there were a couple, a couple bad incidences, um, where we lost guys from our squadron and it was very challenging because, there's a whole bunch of weird little scenarios that had to ha that had to happen for this the uh I was supposed to be in one of the labs that um that got catastrophically blown up. Uh we lost three guys and I could have very easily been in that lab very easily. It was a, a flip choice of mine of yes or no do I want to go with you. And at the time I was like no not right now. I'm just waiting for my kit you guys go up. Um, so I could have been in that one. Um, there was another time where we got, like our lab got blown up, but then lightly, right? Everyone was fine, but we lost our lab. So the section got broken in half and I went in the rear lab, uh, the rear engineer group and the rest, half the section went into a Buffalo up front and the Buffalo took our spot and that got blown up like in a massive way the guys came out of it alive, but had it been our lab, we would have been toast. Right. So there was a lot of those, again, not so not quite close calls, but little happenstances that could have kicked in. And that, that really started to play in when we got home and I started seeing people like live their lives and you start going like, why, 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 why that guy? Because you know, he has, he's got a family, he's got kids that now have to grow up without him. And I'm a 23 year old dude that could have easily, you know, disappeared. So it's, it, it's really, it sucks the life out of you initially when you get there, uh, when you get home. What I've learned over time is that it, it's not a question of them or me because that question has already been solved, 
right? <laughs> there, there's no going back from that. The question now is, do we live for them or do we not? Right? We're, we're here. That There's no choice about it. So we can either have a really great life for them and raise our kids and give them the memories and make sure that they never forget the sacrifices. Or we can not. <laughs> and like, that's not even a fucking choice. We're going to live a good life. And I'm going to make it the best life I can. So because at the end of the day, like when we were in Afghanistan, yeah, sure, we had a government mandate and we had a, this is the mission and blah, 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 blah. But every day when I was clearing a lane, it wasn't because the government told me to be there. It was so that the guys behind me didn't blow up. So it was always for them. And even now, it still is. Nothing changed. Why are we podcasting? Exactly. <laughs> it's it's them. for them. Yep. It's for helping others find their way back from that horrible place of PTSD. It's a, uh, it's a learning experience. You know, I, yeah, it was shitty. It still is, right? Like PTSD doesn't really go away. You just learn how to manage it better. And there will always be bad days and there will always be good days and there will always be days in the middle. And, um, but if we don't learn from it, then you're just going to sit there like that never ends. Right. Th those peaks again, peaks and valleys, right? Just you want, if you have a bad day, you want it to be at a three or four, not a nine. If you have a, a, a good day, you, you know, try to keep it four five, six. But if you, it's a fucking like, Oh my God, it's so much. You don't want that. You just, Keep it smooth. Keep it chill. <laughs> I'm, I'm a big proponent of balance and like take and taking the time. That's the other part. Understanding that like we're all here. We're all having different experiences and yet we're all having the same experiences. So why not learn from each other? For you to come home with this experience under your belt now, what did life look like when you got home? <laughs> and how did you piece together this puzzle that I have PTSD. Oh, that was uh, that was a long road. Um, so I came back from, I went back to the unit, obviously, and kept working. And I got this one. This one hurt a lot, but I think I was I think I'd been home for like. So when you yeah, when you get back from Afghanistan, there's like there's three days where you have to like fill out paperwork, paperwork and you're at work and you're still in your camis and you're like, you're walking around in your tans. Um, and then you take post, uh, post deployment leave. So you're gone for like a month or so after that. But in those first three days, I showed up with me and two other guys and we got brought into our new warrants office who we had never met. And our first interaction with him was, he told us, look, I know you guys just got back from Afghanistan and you think you're hot shit, but you're not. You're still pieces of shit sprogs and you'll do what I fucking tell you. Do you understand? And we were like, yes, Warren. He goes, good. Get the fuck out of my office. And we're like, okay. And that was our reintroduction to the unit. So all three of us were just like, why are we here now? Like, what the fuck are we supposed to like? Okay. And, uh, and this is just that. So we got, <laughs> this is another side story, but uh, when we flew back, we flew into Canada after, after tour uh, on the way in at about an hour or so before we got to Edmonton, we had two CF 18 uh, fighters on our wings, escorting us home. And uh, the pilots radio transmitted to our pilot. And then our pilot read verbatim, like uh, how honored they were to be escorting us home and that we were all heroes and blah, blah, blah. And then we land and we got a police escort to the base through the down, like the middle of Edmonton. Right. And we get home and there's this big, like, Hey, you know, fucking awesome. Welcome home. You guys did great. You guys are awesome. Blah, blah, blah. And I show up to work and the guy's like, you're still a piece of shit. And I was like, Oh, okay. Cool, man. Thanks. <laughs> so it was a shitty way to come home. Um, but a little bit after that, I got moved over into the intelligence cell which really helped me quite a bit. So I started the engineers do their own intelligence 
teams. So we take all of the explosive intelligence and stuff and we're like, ooh, this is cool new fancy gear and what do they do? And uh, so I got to still be kind of part of Afghanistan. It wasn't a complete shift out. So I still was getting the intelligence reports and I was still briefing the CEO and the RSM and I was like, I was involved in the kind of the game still in the, in the fight, but I was still constantly trying like, when's the next tour? I want to get back to the field troops. I want to go on the next tour. Like, let's get this going. So I was there for about a year and a half, um, trying to get that in. Finally got back to the field troops. Um, I was going to go on another tour and all this while I've been noticing that like that little bit of bitterness that had crept in at the end of Afghanistan, that never went away. And it just, everything became more, I was more and more critical of everybody. I fucking didn't want to talk to people after at the end of work. I didn't want to be involved in the unit in any way outside of work and tour. Um, and I, I became a very, very bitter corporal, which is the pretty standard trope in the army. Right. And uh, that went on for a little while, was supposed to go on tour, got taken off tour. That was a whole other issue between me and uh, some other people and got put into resources troop. And I got my own command. I was a corporal <laughs> and I was a section commander, which is a sergeant's job. And I had 14 people underneath me and I had to run boat ops. So I had to like understand the boats. And I, I'm from the prairies, man. I don't, <laughs> I don't do boats. <laughs> They're like, here's... 10 zodiacs and here's motors and here's all this other stuff and i'm like i don't know how to do any of this shit um but again that that level of bitterness kept coming in and then i started to notice that like i would come home pissed just fucking livid that i even had to be there i was like this is the dumber shit and then i'd wake up in the morning and i would dread going into work and then i started to notice that i wasn't sleeping and then i started to notice that everything like you know, it starts to compound on everything, right? I have a bad day because there was some idiot started popping off fireworks behind my house randomly, right? That set me off. I didn't get any sleep that night or um, somebody, some fucking driver would piss me off and I'd get enraged and all this other stuff. Uh, and it didn't really catch up to me until I left for Meaford. So I got promoted to Master Corporal in 2012 and then or I got appointed to Mass Corporal. It's a, not a promotion, but whatever. Um, and I got posted to Meaford, Ontario as an instructor. And I got there and I realized that very quickly, I actually enjoyed it. <laughs> like I, I enjoyed being there. The people were awesome. They treated me like an adult. I was, you know, given responsibilities. I was doing cool stuff and I still wasn't sleeping. And I was like, okay, so it's not just the work. Right? It's not just the place that's pissing me off, that's causing me to be angry all the time. Um, and so I called my wife and I was like, because um, she was in Edmonton, I was IR posted to Meaford, so I was by myself. That was the other part of it was I didn't have anyone else to really like blame it on. Like, oh, my wife is rolling around the end of the, at night. Um, and she, her and I were talking and I'm like, yeah, I'm still not really sleeping. I'm getting like two, three hours of sleep a night of like broken up sleep right like an hour here 20 minutes here just not great and i would work all week and then on friday i'd be so fucking exhausted i sleep for 18 hours like my body would just shut me down and then wake up saturday night and you'd be like okay let's do this all again and you just keep going so uh she was like well talk to the doctors maybe it's just a sleep issue and i was like that's a yeah, I guess. I mean, it could be. It could just be a sleep thing. And so I went down to the docks the next day and um, and I, I walked in there. I'm like, hey, yeah, so I need to talk to somebody about, like, I'm just not sleeping very well. Who do I talk to? And they're like, well, you got to talk to the uh, to this guy and he'll tell you uh, what to do. And so I sat down and chatted with him and he went through a ser like a checklist basically of like, so do you have bad dreams? I'm like, yeah. And he's like, do you, uh, do you, not sleep very often. I'm like, yeah. And do you get angry really easily? I'm like, yeah. Do you, and like, you know, the, the standard PTSD checklist, right? <laughs> and he's hit, I'm hitting every single one without thinking about it. He did it really well. And it was more of a conversation than it was a question checklist. And, uh, 
and then he was like, okay, cool. Well, we'll hook you up with the, the base psychologist and we'll see if we can't, you know, figure out how to better your sleep. And just so you know, I want to tell you, like, I really applaud your courage for coming in here. And I was like, courage, <laughs> fuck man. I like, I, it's just a sleep issue. And then, uh, and yeah, no, it wasn't just a sleep issue. <laughs> so, and that's where it kicked in. And then I started seeing a doc and, uh, he was like, oh yeah, no, you were like, you're, sh- sh- you've hit all the markers for post-traumatic stress. You got depression as well. And you got these like, and just started making the list and anxiety and all these things. And I was like, seriously, I thought it was just like, I didn't sleep well, or maybe I need a new bed or something. And he's like, no, new mattress isn't going to help this, but <laughs> you need to do some serious work. Uh, and then that, that's where I was like, oh, okay. The one benefit was my career was never discussed. Like I know people that have, uh, they went to their boss and they're like, I, I'm, I'm not doing well and I, I need to see some help. And they were told specifically, like, if you go see the doctors, it will affect your career. And my career never came up. Not once. It wasn't actually until two months before my contract ended that I had to go to my ad and be like, hey, sir, so my contract's ending. Should I be like doing some paperwork or <laughs> like what's going on? And it was at the, uh, it was actually at my release medical. That the doctor was like, I went over the list of all my injuries and, you know, like my, my knees are shot. I got torn ligaments in all my knees, my herniated disc in my back, uh, torn ligaments in both my shoulders. My hearing is, I have inner ear, inner ear, uh, degenerative nerve damage plus tinnitus and then the PTSD. And the, and the doc was like, how are you walking, let alone working? And I was just like, you know, left, right, left, right. <laughs> they teach us very early in the army. Um, and they're like, no, this release is going to be a medical release and you're going to get covered. So like the base there helped me so much. Um, and yeah, I was the only guy releasing and there was one VA rep that was on base. So I got like one-on-one from the VA and me as I was releasing. And because it was a short term, they were just like, sign everything. We'll apply for everything and see where the chips fall. And so like, I, again, I got taken care of pretty well. Um, but that is not the, that is not the standard uh, of care at the moment. And that's what I'm a big advocate for <laughs> making sure that there is one standard. And it was the way I went out. Everybody deserves that experience. Uh, post-traumatic stress most likely is going to happen in your service career. It's just a matter of when and when you're willing to finally acknowledge that it is there. You do run from it for, for a certain amount of time. Uh, but I'm glad to hear that your experience was actually somewhat positive where the career never really came into question. You were allowed to continue to do what you wanted to do. You had the support and stability behind you. You had the paycheck. Uh, Because we have heard of stories, I have heard of stories, where men lose their careers, women lose their careers. And now what do they do? And it's unfortunate. There There is a statistic out there of veterans that end up on out here on Hastings. Uh, no home homeless Mm -hmm. because they just got axed and they didn't get the medical pension and they have nothing. And now they have no support and life is not good for them. So I'm glad to hear that your experience was, was a positive chance. Um, And I'm sure that played an overall role into your recovery as well. Absolutely. Yeah. It, uh, well, the, the big one, there's a few like, big hits that uh that gave me the like you need to fuck sort your shit out <laughs> and uh one of them was um alcohol it's real easy to just start drinking you know like it is the it's the standard go-to for the military across the board if you're having a rough time go for a drink right even with friends or whatever but it's always you know oh, it's a rough day i'm gonna crack beer oh it's a you know it's a really rough day we're going to start getting into the whiskey or, oh, we got friends over. Let's friggin' give her, right? Like, it's always the number one choice for self-medication. And yeah, I started going down that road and I realized that uh, there was at one point in time I was, I got a really good bottle of bourbon. It was really like delicious. And I was playing video games for a couple hours 
and I just, you know, you fill up the cup a little bit and you, you drink from it and then you fill the cup up and I just kind of kept doing that while I was playing and I went to fill the cup up and the bottle was empty. And I was like, this bottle was full when I started. So who's been drinking my whiskey? <laughs> and, uh, and I think there were, you know, it was little things like that that kind of clued me in like, hey, dude, like you might want to slow down. This is probably not the best road to go down. Um, and there were days where like I'd run out of beer in the fridge and I'd be like, oh man, I need to go get some beer. And just saying that out loud, I was like, wait a second, do I need to get some beer? Like, is that the right quit? And so I had those little markers. And then I think one day uh, my wife came home from work and I had passed out in my office chair with like seven or eight beers or something like that around the, uh, around the keyboard. And she cleaned them up and let me sleep there. And when I woke up, she was like, what's going on? I was like, ah, you know, I had a bad day. She was like, you had a bad day? Okay. So what? And I was like, well. And I didn't have an answer for her. <laughs> it's like, okay, no, that makes sense. And that, and it was at that point where I was like, okay, this isn't, this isn't good. I'm not going down the road. Like I'm, I'm hitting all the markers again. I don't want to do this anymore. And, uh, you know, you and I were talking about earlier, I think everyone hits their rock bottoms in certain areas and not having an answer for that question for drinking. That was mine. And I was like, okay, I got it. I have to stop this. And so I was like, you know what? I'm just going to stop. I'm going to stop drinking completely. And the first, first couple of weeks was challenging, right? You're always seeing it. You're always like, Ooh, oh, that guy's going, oh, we should go for a drink. Oh, we should blow. You're always seeing it. Right. And I was just like, okay, no, 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 no. Let's just not do this. And uh, yeah, so I, I think I went a month and a half, two months, no drinking. And by the end of it, I was just, I didn't really care. And then we went out to a restaurant and I ordered a beer. And it, it was just like I tasted it. And I was like, yeah, this is, this is pretty good. But I have no desire to, like the desire had gone away as like a medication form because I figured out the tools I needed to use. Uh, instead of that, right? And I, I think a lot of us just kind of let it stay there for a while without figuring out the other tools. And so it just becomes that always that old, the old reliable, right? <laughs> it's such a bad place to go. So for you now, like, have you had the opportunity to dive into why you why you drank at that time or or what in in your perspective or in your mind why does why does addiction happen it's like look, looking back on it it was the fact that i i needed something else to think about and the best way to think about something else is to i'm, I'm a pretty my brain runs at a pretty high speed and I'm constantly figuring stuff out and doing stuff and um, alcohol slowed it down. So instead of, you know, being constantly aware and hyper vigilant all the time, looking at everything and, Oh my God, I checked this door and did I check that door? And is this one locked? And is anybody going to come in? I don't know. I could drink and it would slow me down where it would be like, okay, okay. I can, I like, I can kind of handle it right now. Um, the problem is, is that that's basically the, that hypervigilance and the, all the, the major symptoms is like, it's like putting a speaker on your floor, right? And you turn music on and you leave your speaker there and you go, okay, well, that's pretty loud. So I'm going to put a blanket over it, right? And that's the alcohol, you know, you need to slow down. You need to just, I need the volume lower it, but instead of actually dealing with the problem and lowering the volume you're just throwing a blanket on it. But over time, it continues to be loud, right? And somebody might kick the blanket off and you'll get like, oh shit. And then you, again, you hit a, you hit a spike and um, because you're not actually dealing with the problem, you're just covering it with something. And 
I think that's where alcohol and substance abuse and all this other stuff kicks in is because traditionally within the military, that's the process, right? That's how you probably, the, the old school thing of, uh, you know, sitting around the fire, drinking ale at the end of a battle and all the guys would sit around and talk about shit and be like, whoa, man, I saw that guy's get hit that dude got hit in the head with a mace and his fucking head exploded. It was crazy. And the old sergeant's like, yeah, man, that shit like that happens. And they're all drinking, right? Like that's part of the culture. Um, but nowadays, <laughs> like you don't, you don't get issued alcohol anymore. Sometimes you do for like special occasions, but for us, we go out and drink on our own and then we drink more and we drink more and we drink more because you're just trying to put more and more blankets on top of that speaker and the speaker's getting louder because you're not dealing with it and you're just trying to put more and eventually all the blankets in the house are on top of that speaker and the speaker's still going nothing's like so <laughs> and then in order to actually deal with the speaker or to deal with the problem you have to go under you have to start pulling all those blankets off you have to start dealing with now you have to deal with this issue first before you can get to that issue and the the ptsd is getting worse because you're not drinking anymore right it's worse it's not really getting worse it's just you're seeing uh you're seeing it more because you're not dulling it by self-medicating because you have to deal with the medicating to get to like it it's this really hard circle i mean you know it like lots of guys know it and uh it is it's a dark route it's a dark road to go down but i think a lot of us go there because it, it's part kind of part of the culture initially and then it gets developed i think for me like my even just to reflect on my own journey into addiction my addiction came from the pain and the suffering from the years of the trauma unresolved uh, emotional issues from calls. And one of the things that you and I talked about too, or I asked you a question, I said, Hey, did you get any, well, before we even did the interview, I said, did you get any trauma before the military? And you just kind of laughed. And I was like, Oh, you understand childhood trauma. Perfect. We'll talk about that too. Right. But yeah, like it's so interesting now at this stage of the game to fall apart from PTSD and have to walk through the fire of addiction. Maybe you went to rehab, maybe you didn't. Either way, you gain sobriety and you're now doing it differently and you can now piece together, okay, why did the PTSD really come in? And I think too, that's this really important component of even for you, Chance, like the PTSD came in because of the military, like the trauma just pushed you over the edge. Mm -hmm. But you also recognize too now being able to talk about this entire journey of life and you can reflect back on your childhood and your trauma from that space as well. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I mean, it's trauma is really tricky, right? Because trauma is basically memory and your memory is subject to um, the normalcy of the culture. Right. So whatever is considered normal in that culture as you're growing up, it seems normal. If we had human sacrifices as a part of the culture, okay. Like <laughs> it would be fucked up, but yeah, okay, cool. Um, and I, I remember reading an article many years ago. I don't have no idea where it is anymore, but they were doing some sort of study about the prevalence of post-traumatic stress in the first world versus the third world. And there was a lot less reporting of post-traumatic stress in the third world. And I don't think that there isn't post-traumatic stress in the third world. I just think it's normalized, right? Like trauma and death and all the stuff is normal. That is how people grow up. That's how people see, um, that's how they experience their lives. And people in the, you know, us in the first world in the, you know, uh, North America, we have it so fucking good. We have it so good um, that, yeah, when we experience the more baser elements that there is to life, it's fucking traumatic, right? If you've never experienced death in your whole life and you get a puppy and it gets run over by a car and that's your first experience with death, that's horribly traumatic at the time. And then you grow up and, you know, you talk to people and you get 
exposed to a little bit more and somebody says, oh yeah, you know, my dog died and, and it's, it's rough. And you start to go, oh, okay. And you gain a little bit of acceptance for it. And you start to gain a little bit more. And, these, and it's through the intercourse of, uh, of gaining experiences through life that you then can understand that uh, you can let go of that trauma where it becomes, oh, okay. So that is a normal part of life. Okay. And slowly work on it. Um, one of the challenges that, you know, we suffer first responder slash veteran slash dispatcher, um, you know, corrections officer, whatever, is we get exposed to the base elements of life and death every day. And then we're, we go right back to the non-baser elements every day, especially for police. Like you're, I, I, I would never want to be a police officer specifically because you are involved with the dregs of society every day, every day. And yes, there are good points and yes, you get to help the community and yes, you get to be involved and you get to take away bad guys and that's awesome. But then you have to go home, right? And you, you still know that the danger is out there. You still know that the bad guys are out there. They haven't gone away <laughs> and you're sitting in your house going like they could be here any minute. Whereas, you know, when we were in Afghanistan, that was every day too. We we were in enemy held country. Okay, cool. We know it. We know it. But we came home <laughs> into non enemy held territory, right? But we still think we are, and uh, it, it is. I think I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Could you repeat the question for me? Because I think I, I think I went on a tangent there. No, you still you still had a lot of really good valid points. And I mean, even when uh, when I spent some time in rehab, uh, there was a few military boys there, and it's funny because whenever I would sit down with a military individual, and even yourself, like I have the immense amount of respect for you because you served overseas, and I know how hard that would have been to be there every single day. Uh, and when I hear stories of guys doing, you know, multiple tours, I'm just like, man, that must be so difficult, so much trauma, right? And then as I'm giving, you know, even say yourself in this situation, the uh, the immense respect that you deserve and the thanks and the praise behind the tours and the trauma that you encountered, you then flip it around and you're like, yeah, but I couldn't do your job because it's you're you're doing the same thing, but at home in a democratic society with the threats at home knocking on your door and it's such an interesting moment for a police officer in a military person to sit down and to reflect on where the the struggle was for us in our careers right and that's always kind of the, and i'm glad you brought it up for one but the original question was childhood trauma oh, right. um, and how we how we dove into that i mean yeah the squirrel it happens <laughs> i do the same thing too yeah. my mind just doesn't work the same as it used to uh but that's okay now one thing i'm not going to push you on the childhood trauma because i don't like to push people on childhood trauma it's a very personal experience but as long as you can uh, understand the concepts of if you fall apart from PTSD, there's a very high likelihood, if not a hundred percent chance that there is childhood trauma somewhere in there as well. And I think as long as we're, we're bringing this forward to people that are listening to the podcast, it's going to help them connect the dots of how do I deal with the post-traumatic stress? Because I saw this challenge too, even walking into rehab, I walked in and I said, Hey, let's deal with my trauma from policing. And then it was told, that's the tip of the iceberg above water. Mm -hmm. Like the other part of this is the massive amounts of childhood trauma you went through as a child that you have never looked at in your entire life. And I had to look at all of this together. And But that's how I was able to heal. Yep. Yeah, that's, I remember how I got on that train of thought too, because I was talking about normalizing things. And yeah, a lot of the childhood trauma, we don't recognize as trauma because it's normalized. It's within our family. Right. It's just the way it is. And, uh, I mean, I, I, I'll do this quickly, but the, uh, for me, I was the youngest of three. Um, and my parents not having a lot of money, they were working a lot. So I was alone a lot. Um, or I was with my siblings a lot, but again, because I'm the youngest, my ideas never get done. We never do what I want to do, blah, blah, blah. So I had this really innate need to be heard. 
and uh and I had no I had no tools to handle the anger that I was getting from all this the stuff that was happening to me so um this is kind of a funny story looking back on it at the time uh it was horribly traumatic at the time but I was in the bathtub and I was pretty young I think I was uh I would have been four or five something like that I was maybe five anyway I was in the bathtub and my sister came running into the thing and she was just like chance chance the 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 girl you really like is outside you should come say hi and i was like okay and i ran outside but naked right and uh yeah maybe yeah i was five or six anyway and i run outside and i'm like looking around like oh where is she where is she and then my brother and sister locked the fucking door and then i realized like oh shit i'm naked and i'm outside and it's a it's like a sliding glass door and i can just see them the two of them sitting there like laughing their fucking asses off at me and at the time like i i I look back on it as kind of a funny story but it's horribly traumatic to do to like a five or six year old right (laughs) just it's horrible i would never imagine doing that to my kids let alone having the siblings do it to you right so there were lots of incidents throughout my life of little things like that i call them little but yeah you when you start dealing with your PTSD, you start realizing how much that is linked to everything else. Right. And my desire to be heard pushes basically everything that I, all the stupid shit that I did and all the, um, all the bad situation that I got into when I was younger that created these traumatic experiences started with those little things of like, I, I, I I just want somebody to look at me. Hello. (laughs) And, once you get into the PTSD side of it, you can go, you start pulling that thread, right? And you're like, wait, wait, this, oh, this, oh shit. Oh shit. Like, oh, holy crap. This goes back a long way. Um, but yeah, so in terms of childhood trauma, absolutely. It's, it, it's almost one-to-one, right? Like if you have someone with PTSD, they're 90 plus percent of the people are going to have childhood trauma as well. You just have to eventually recognize it. <laughs> Well said, Chance. Now, now this, and this is the interesting part too, because we've just spent the last kind of hour and 15 minutes of looking at, okay, uh, your journey that led you to a place of developing PTSD. And I mean, you have every reason in the world to develop this. Not only do you have the childhood trauma, but you've got your service time. No doubt you ended up going down this road of developing all of the symptoms behind PTSD, going down into a road of the depression, the anxiety, the sleep issues, the cyclical thought, uh, probably some paranoia in there as well. Uh, Started to flirt with addiction. And now you're home and you're trying to heal, but that inner circle the people that are there for you, the ones that really care for you most, you're probably starting to push them away. And the social isolation is a big part of the story too, right? Mm -hmm. And you're becoming unwell. You get diagnosed, you start to heal, you start to learn about all of these things that you're doing are actually not healthy. So now as a dad, how are you taking your experience of what you've learned from the military and the post-traumatic stress that's within. And now as a father, because at this point now, kids were starting to become a part of your life now, Mm -hmm. and you've left the military. How are you looking now at yourself and how are you being critical about, okay, where do I need to go as a father to ensure that my kids have a highly successful life? And they don't get to see this side of me or how much of that side did they see and how did that impact you? Uh, well, that's a great question. The, it's going to lead me down a few roads. So strap in, (laughs) be a gooder. Um, so my first son was born five months before I got out of the army. And so not only did I leave the military, uh, as a master corporal, as a recruit instructor, right? I was a drill instructor. So I was used to yelling and people doing exactly what I said and, uh, and teaching people, but teaching adults, right? When I, you do this, they will do that. I'm like, okay, if you do X, it will be faster. And then they do it. And you're like, see, good, excellent. Move on from that kind of instructing to dealing with a five month old baby that he's not going to listen. And when I yell, he's scared. And he's going to cry. And I, like, I had no idea how to handle this. And that was one of the 
one of the major precursors to getting the help I needed was uh, I walked into the room and he flinched at one point. I think he was just about a year old. And uh, just the act of me walking into the room, like I didn't make any noise. I didn't scare him. It like terms of jump scaring, but like he, he saw me come into the room and was like, Oh my God, like what's he going to, what's going to happen now? And again, I, you know, it was another one of my rock bottom points where I was just like, this isn't okay. I, I can't let that happen. And uh, so I started seeing a doc uh, in Edmonton and there, there, this was a really challenging time. So I got home once we got back to Edmonton. Um, he, Arden was about six months old. And then I started seeing this doctor through the OSI clinic here in Edmonton. And he was not a great fit for me. Um, you know, one of my big triggers was Arden, my son. And for weeks, I'd be seeing this doctor every week, once a week. And I would say, you know, you know, uh, yeah, Arden tripped me out again, or he started screaming and that hurt my head. And, and after about six months of seeing this guy, I realized that he had to check his notes every single time. Like he couldn't remember Arden's name. And I was like, I talk about him every, like every week. Um, and yet like he's the doctor. Okay. I'll just, I'll deal. And, uh, I did another six months with him and th like every day again, I would, he, he would give me, he would start working with exposure therapy, exposure therapy right off the bat. So I would sit there for an hour reliving the absolute worst day of my fucking life. And then he'd be like, okay, man, well, you know, that's a, are you going to be okay driving home? And I'd be like, mm-hmm, right? Like, get the fuck out of my face, right? Like, I just need to leave. And uh, and then I'd drive home completely pissed off, and then I'd be, like, just jacked up for probably two, three days afterwards, and I'd finally have a day where I'd be like, okay, Whew, you know, my nervous system finally calmed down, and I'm like, okay, and then I realized two more days, I got to go see this fucker again. And then I'd spend the next two, three days just absolutely depressed and beat down. I'm like, fuck, I don't want to see this guy. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. And then I'd show up that day and be like, okay, let's, uh, let's go do it again, doc. And so for, like, I saw this guy for a year and it just made me worse and worse and worse and worse. And I was talking to my buddy who had been out for a while. And he said, you do know you can see whoever you want, right? And I was like, what? I was like, yeah, like if they're blue cross covered, man, you're good to go. Like, find a doctor that helps. And I was like, Oh, I'd like, I just, this was the guy the army tend me to right. And same mentality of just, I'll do whatever the army tells me. And then, uh, so then I started looking for a trauma specialist and I found one that does equine therapy and I started working with horses and I started, and again, being, you know, from the country and being on, out on family's ranch, horses were a big part of life. Um, and I found time. And so now as a father and as a, you know, leader, as a teacher, as a instructor of people, the biggest thing that I especially pass on to my boys is time. Take time. If you are having a freak out, okay, sit in it for a second, right? Take the time, bring yourself back down and then move forward. Don't try and push through it. Don't try and shovel it down. Like just take a second breathe and so now when my kids have you know freakouts, that's the first thing i say to them i'm like okay boys breathe breathe and then I'll, I'll do the same thing and i slow down with them and i'm i get everyone to just take time let's all just calm down um so yeah unfortunately my, uh, my oldest arden he saw me through that first year of just worse 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 but he's also seen me find the new doctor and get better and better and better and better and better and better. And he also, like, I have the podcast, I have the walk for veterans. I have the, you know, all these other things that I, I get to help others. But my wife brought this up at one point. She was like, this is a living Testament to your son. This is like every piece of this, they're going to grow up and they're going to watch at some point and they're going to have a better understanding of who you are as a person. Um, and that's going to help that next generation. And that's going to help the next generation because a, it's all recorded, right? It's all on here digitally. If you know, so long as the world doesn't end in the next little while, <laughs> uh, 
you know, we'll be able to, like that next generation will have that have those tools. They'll have those um, the skill sets and the abilities and so on and so forth. And um, we were talking about this earlier, but one of the things that led me on this journey of sharing and being open and being honest and being aware was uh, my granddad was a he's a World War II vet. Uh, he's an engineer as well, and he never talked about the war, not once. Um, well, little bits and pieces. Uh, we got. My brother found an Italian army issued knife at one point in one of the closets or whatever, and was like, Hey, Zeta, what, uh, what's this for? And he's like, yeah, the guy who had it didn't need it anymore. And then he just took it away from us. And we were like, okay. <laughs> like, um, you know, stuff like that. And he, but yeah, he never talked about the war, never went to Remembrance Day ceremonies, didn't go to Legion didn't talk to any of his buddies, just completely separated from it. And uh, he suffered every day, every day, 70 plus years after the war. Um, but he just kept pushing through it, kept pushing through it, kept pushing through it. And then finally, when I got back from Afghanistan, him and I had a conversation. We sat down and he told me a little bit about the war. And at one point I was like, dude, like he was telling us, telling me how much he respected us for what we did. And I was like, you walked across Europe right i drove around the desert for a few months <laughs> you literally walked across europe and he's like yeah but at least i knew who i was fighting and i went that's a good point <laughs> that's a good point um but yeah we had this little conversation and i looked at him and i just like i could see a little bit of the weight of the years of trauma that he has just stacked onto his back over the years i saw a little bit come off because he finally had someone to talk to but he was 90, right? By the time him and I sat down for that chat. And, or maybe he was like 87 or something, but he was almost 90, right? And he spent most of his life in pain, in silence. And I was like, I am never going to be that guy. I'm not doing this. And so uh, that's like when I started seeing the new doctor and I started doing um, veteran advocacy and I started working towards not only bettering myself, but bettering the community because... I don't, not only do I don't want to be that guy, I don't want to see any of my brothers or sisters be that person either. Wow. I am completely rocked by emotion. As we sit here, there are a ton of different thoughts swirling, even in my own head in the, the front runner to this, this dialogue. Cause we just unpacked a lot of stuff. <laughs> we talked about you obviously as a dad. Yeah. And now shifting your mentality of you have to strip away this military persona because it just doesn't fit in the family structure, especially with children. And you and I talked specifically about how I had to spend 45 minutes with my daughter today about her hair. Mm -hmm. Her hair was causing an issue. And once I finally spent the time with her to work through the temper tantrum, it came out that there was a much different issue behind that, the trigger for her, and we were able to uncover it. And if you don't have that time, you miss that. And you just start to create little issues for these humans that you're bringing into the world. Mm -hmm. So I applaud you for one, for being a dad that understands that you really do have to take the time with your kids to teach them the very simple things that a lot of kids unfortunately do not understand or never get taught. And that is the, the time, the breathing, the meditation, recognizing what's going on in the body and not running from it, but just allowing it to happen. And when it's, it's done, you can, you can connect now and you can talk about it and you can process, process what you just went through. So, I mean, that, that is such a huge lesson. And I think any dad out there really needs to understand that being a dad really is about checking your own shit. That's like, you have to, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you have to flip whatever you are as a human being onto its head and go, okay, I can only lead with compassion and empathy and sympathy. And, uh, I need to completely remove anger for the most part. I can't think of any healthy, reasons why anger would come out um, other than maybe like a protection type of thing for your children if they were in harm's way. But yeah. there are so many different ways of like, and if you have PTSD, the challenge to now address PTSD on top of being a parent so that you can have the things that you need in order to be a healthy parent. So and then we segued into obviously this relationship with your father, which again is so profound, Grand, even in of, of itself. 
sorry, grandfather. Yeah. Um, because, and again, this is such a, such an issue I see with men is a lot of times men don't understand the men above them because of their life experience. And especially that older generation, they just stayed so guarded mm -hmm. and they never really were able to connect with the next generation and share that knowledge. Uh, so I applaud you even for what you're doing here in your own journey, Chance. Uh, I mean, I've got my podcast, you've got your own. I truly believe you are in the right space here, my friend, talking about your journey and making sure that men can be vulnerable. That they can share their pain and their suffering and they can share what it looks like and how they were able to get through it and lead a much different life. So post-traumatic growth is something that is incredibly important to me. And I know you have a lot of friends that unfortunately fall into PTSD and they can't come out. Mm -hmm. And we do have to respect that because we understand that sometimes you get lost and it's some guys, some women don't come out. And that's the unfortunate reality of it. But for you, where are you and where does this journey continue for you from this point on? Um. I'm learning and I, I don't see that ever stopping. I'm, I'm still figuring new ways out and new iterations. And, um, the, the one thing that, you know, there are lots of people that you're saying that people don't come out of it and it, it's true. You can get lost in there. The real key thing is I can only show someone the door, right? As, as much as, you know, as many tools as I give you, as many, you know, nights to sleep on my couch or, you know, ears to lend you for uh, phone calls, whatever. I can't make you do anything. I can't make you work on yourself. I can't make you um, take the time to understand yourself. I can't help you. I can help you learn the tools. I can, again, I can show you the door. Like, right, it's, it's over there. All you got to do is take that path. This is the beginning of it, right? It's up to the every individual to make that choice and go, okay. And, and here's the other part of it. It's going to suck. <laughs> like, and this is the learning process. Every, this is, I tell my boys this too. I tell other veterans this. I tell uh, basically anybody that'll listen. Uh, I tell them this is that if you want to learn a new skill, you're going to suck right off the bat. Right. It's brand new. You have no idea what to do. Yeah. You're going to suck. Um, Jiu-jitsu is a great allegory for this because um, you do suck when you first start. <laughs> it doesn't matter what your instincts tell you. What your instincts tell you in terms of jiu-jitsu, it's basically wrong. Um, but eventually you'll, you'll gain a level of understanding that, okay, I have a pretty good handle on what's going on, but then you get humbled, as we were saying earlier. And then you realize, oh, shit, I got a lot more to learn. And I think I'm, I'm somewhere in there where I'm like, <laughs> I got, I got a lot more to learn. Um, but there's a, uh, I got taught this on my, uh, my mountain ops course was when you're, you climb up a line, you get to the top of the, whatever the climb is, if you, you're going to have people behind you. So you get to the top and in that one instance, you just put your hand back. And if they take your hand, cool. If not, cool. And you just carry on. It's not a, you're not pitying the person, right? You're just offering them a hand. If they want to take it. It's up to them. But again, it's up to them. And uh, for me, that's where I'm at. I just, I'm, I'm still learning and I, I got my hand out. If people need a hand, I'm here to help. And that's what the Tools for the Toolbox podcast is about. That's what this podcast is about is that here's, here's the tools. You can build whatever you fucking want right here's the tools and and then we all just have to kind of figure it out on our own so i'm i'm still figuring it out i got uh you know keep myself busy with, <laughs> with all kinds of stuff um but yeah I, I i i'm looking forward to the next 10 years or so because i get to watch my boys become men um i get to develop my podcast into something that is helpful to other people i get to enjoy i get to start enjoying life i think that's where i'm at where i'm like <laughs> i'm starting to enjoy life 
even with the hard days. Those will always be there. When I first started to experience positive emotion, I didn't know how to handle it <laughs> because I had lived with so much negative emotion for so long and yep. PTSD chance. And you're yep. nodding your head. So, you know, you totally, oh, yeah. you totally get this. When I first started to really actually enjoy life, I was like, wait a second. I enjoy this. This is fun. There's good feelings here. Am I even allowed to this do is, this? <laughs> yeah. Am I allowed to do this? Wait a second. But that's, then that's how twisted the journey into PTSD becomes. Like it just becomes such this gnarly place of just negativity. And it's not where any human being should be at any point in their life. But unfortunately yeah. it does happen. And the fact that you're doing this, I, again, I applaud you. So your, your podcast, uh, where can people find you? Let's go over the name real quick. When did it start? Uh, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the project, where it's at and where we need to get it for you. Okay. Um, so the podcast tools for the toolbox, you can get it anywhere. It's on Spotify, Google, Apple, whatever, wherever you get your podcasts it's on there. And, um, I'm mostly on Instagram. Sometimes I'm on Facebook, sometimes LinkedIn, that kind of stuff. I post all the stuff there. Um, the, the majority of it is on my YouTube channel tools for the toolbox. Um, again, you can look it up there that has all the, all the episodes in video and audio or video audio right um i've just uploaded all the video episodes on spotify as well so those are on video as well um but otherwise audio and it's actually funny it got started because in the bar that's where it got started <laughs> me and some of the boys were out drinking uh you know shits and giggles and chatting and like oh how's life and so on and so forth and uh this is over a span of time right but like we would link up and we'd hang out and we'd chat and have dinner and blah 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 and invariably, over multiple iterations, somebody would come in and be like, oh, yeah, I had a rough fucking week. This just didn't feel good. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm just not feeling great. I'm, I, you know, I think I might, I might ditch earlier, go to bed or something. And somebody would be like, have you been going to the gym? Or have you gone to the range? When was the last time you got a massage? Right? Little tidbits of things that work for them. Self-care. And I started going like, Okay. I started to realize that we all have our own little tools that we use. And then I started thinking like, why are we only keeping it within this little, that the dinner table, right? Or somebody that could overhear us uh, on the side of the table. And <clears throat> while I was processing that over multiple days and weeks, we, uh, I got together with another group of friends and we were all sitting there chatting and uh, having drinks. And we probably had a couple too many, but we had this really in-depth, like, really deep conversation about what it meant to be a soldier, what it was to be a soldier during a war, before a war, after a war, right? Like what does it actually mean to be that as a, as a person? Um, and it was super great conversation. I can't remember any of it now, but it like, it felt really good at the time. <laughs> and, uh, we got off, we you know, finished up and we left and we were outside talking and somebody was like, man, we should have recorded that. That would have made an awesome podcast. And I was like, indeed <laughs> indeed it would and so that's where i was like this is where we get all our all our tools and throughout all my training in the military i don't know if you got this in the, the academy or the depot um was instructors would be like you know you have to give some sort of allegory or side information to make a point about something else but it kind of applied but didn't really and they would always finish it off with like you may never need this but it'll be another tool for your toolbox at some point and then they'd move on to whatever they were doing. And so that line always caught and stuck with me. And I was like, ah, tool for the toolbox. Uh, 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 uh. So that's where the podcast came from. Uh, I'm two seasons in now. My season two finale is coming out next week. Uh, we'll be on Tuesday. This will probably come out long after it's out. <laughs> we'll be into season three at that point in time. Um, but yeah, I got season three queued up, ready to go. We're starting that. I got uh, all kinds of guests lined up that are it's pretty cool i talked to john striker meyer um the sog legend so he was on the podcast i've had uh, chris romero former master sergeant u.s army on there i've had uh all kinds like 
really, really cool people. Again, just offering the tools that they have uh, kind of to the world. And honestly, the next stage, the next development is going to be more uh, more of that, basically. But I'm expanding from not just veterans um, into first responders, civil servants, just civilians, like everybody. I just I, re I realized over time that the first couple seasons have been me kind of finding my voice on uh, being a podcaster and talking to other veterans is easy because you know, we're veterans. It's easy to just, you, there's a connection there. So now that I'm a bit more comfortable, I'm going to push myself in out of the comfort zone and talk to everybody else because, you know, everybody's got tools and the more tools you have in your toolbox, the better shit you can build once you're there. And then, uh, yeah. So if they want to find it and then, uh, for Instagram, I'm at master corporal Burl, So M C P L B U R L E S. Um, for that and i also got the canadian walk for veterans coming up that's happening in september uh where we walk uh it's a 5k walk it's super chill um and it's you know citizens people canadians walking shoulder to shoulder it's uh serving military veterans first responders civil servants whatever everybody walking together in a non-formal environment because the average canadian the average canadian's experience with veterans is usually during Remembrance Day. And Remembrance Day for us is not a time when we want to be super talkative to people that don't understand. Um, so, you know, they see us in our uniforms and our medals, and we're not really people, right? We're like, ooh, we're on parade. And um, whereas the Walk for Veterans is all about, we're just people. We're just walking, we're, you know, we're your neighbors. We're the people down living down the street that walks my dog in front of your house all the time that you never thought of me as a veteran, but. I am that kind of deal. So again, just uh, more awareness, more conversations, more people helping other, each other and growing the community. That's kind of where we're going. <laughs> Sounds like you found the cure to PTSD. Community, <laughs> connection and compassion. Good for you. Chance Pearls, you found your way, brother. I solved it. <laughs> uh, you, you solved it. Yeah. Quick, put it in a pill. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm inc incredibly impressed by by you for not only, again, being able to navigate through the complex world of PTSD, uh, coming out the other end, not getting divorced, walking through the fear of leaving the military. I mean, that that's a topic all unto itself, right? Leaving the support system that made you unwell and now finding a new space where you have a voice to be able to give back to your people just in a different way. And this life is really built around service and serving others without expectation. And you have done just that. You're now giving back to those people that are going to fill those, those boots. They're going to be in the military. They're going to be the first responders and they're going to be going through some immense struggles. But in order to, much like you did on that training course, reach back and just give a hand for whoever wants it, it's there. Yep. And that's how you help others. So I really do applaud you. When we get this episode coming out, I'm going to make sure that I link up everything so that people can find you very easily. They can move on over. They can support you. I hope by that time you're in a position for, I don't know whether merch might be a thing for you or there's some opportunity to actually really support Chance to see him grow. Um, but we're definitely going to explore that even as well because I mean, if I can give another fellow brother some love i definitely will hands down i appreciate it uh because you're here for the right reasons oh i i do have a patreon i, I rarely am on there but uh i do have one <laughs> I, I found trying to manage like six different social media accounts all at the same time was <laughs> a bit <laughs> much uh, but yeah if people do want to support um i'm always helpful all any money i get involved from that i always put directly back on the podcast it's not never about me so um yeah if they want to, again, tools for the toolbox, uh, or patreon.com slash tools for the tool. I don't, it's on there. Tools for the toolbox. <laughs> Done brother. We're going to get you the support you deserve. Wicked. Appreciate it. Now, before we wrap up today, one of the things that I want to end on is what is it for you 
that you really want to pass on that one golden nugget from this entire lifetime of having had gone through everything you've gone through? What is that one thing for you that you want to put on the silver plate and just say here, here is how you approach life. So it just becomes just a little bit easier because you're going to go through hardship. Yeah. It, uh, it's my new mantra. I, I figured it out a little while ago that it just kind of like clicked in my head uh, and that is grace, not slack. And you know, what that means is giving yourself the grace to try and fail and learn, but not the slack to quit because the, the slack to quit is just, you know, this, this is where the line always gets drawn, right? You, you try something new, you're not very good at it. You kind of suck or you get, uh, you get hurt or you take a little time off or, you don't really like it and you're like, yeah, okay, I don't really want to do this anymore. And you just stop. And then that entire lane of your life that could have gone down that range is gone because you, you decided to stop. Um, but giving yourself the grace to fail and learn because that's how we do anything. That's how we build skill sets. That's how we teach uh, people how to like, Little people, little tiny people, when they first learn how to walk, they fall on their ass all the time. They don't give a shit. They just fall on their ass and they get back up and they keep trying. That's exactly the same thing. They don't know how to be self-critical and, you know, beat themselves up about it. They just go, oh, shit, I fell down. And then they get back up. All right. And that's how we learn. And so give yourself the grace. Take the time. Figure it out. Move on. Just don't quit. <laughs> We all need a little love. And I mean, even for grace, for me, grace is something that I've had to learn. I mean, the self-compassion component of being a man and being able to love yourself inwardly and accept yourself for all of your flaws and not beat yourself up with the guilt or the shame or all that stuff. It's a very hard lesson to learn in life. Yeah. Well, you didn't Especially know. Especially if you've. You didn't know any better, right? <laughs> you did the best you could with what you had at the time. And cool. It ended up in not an ideal situation. Awesome. Move on. How do you figure out what's next, right? How do you build on it? How do you get better? How do you do that? Da, da, da. Just iterate continually. <laughs> Keep going forward, brother. That's it. Always forward. Yeah. It's been an, ob an absolute honor to have you, to be able pleasure. to pick your brain, to get your, your, your insight, your perspective on, on something that can lead to horrible places such as suicide and addiction and the mental health issues that exist with our first responders and cracking this topic wide open and saying, here, here's what it looked like for me, gives others the gift of being able to navigate through this hardship that they will face, no doubt in their career and makes it just a little bit easier. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's one little thing that uh, I was talking about. This was my conversation with Satch um, that I think is, really pertinent um it's how i it's how i talk to like white belts on the jujitsu mats and it's how i teach uh people all the time is that there's gonna there's usually four stages to anything so you're gonna see I, what i'm talking about jujitsu i you know talk about this in life as well there's gonna be a point in time where you see that there was an opening or that there was you know you're getting really angry and you recognize that you're getting really angry and then you you just you don't have the tools to deal with it, right? You just but you see that there was an opening there. Oh, I saw he, I could have grabbed his arm there. That would have made a great arm bar, but you didn't like you just didn't have the skill set to grab it. That's the first step, and that's a win. That is a win because when you get angry and you don't recognize that you're getting too angry, you don't learn anything. But when you get to a point where you go, oh shit, I I'm, I let myself go there. Okay, I need to sort that out. That's the first step. And then the next one is you see it and you try something and it's going to fail. That's just the way it is, right? It's like, oh, there's an arm bar there. I'm going to go for it and phew, he's gone. Or I'm getting really angry. I need to breathe. I need to fucking breathe. I can't fucking breathe right now. But again, that's a win because you saw there was an issue. You tried to rectify it, but you failed. Okay, cool. Good. Move on to the next one. As my shirt says, good right? You tried and you failed. Awesome. Now you know better. And then the next stage is where you're going to try and it's going to kind of work. And again, you can learn from there, 
And then eventually you're going to get to a point where, you know, you get angry and you recognize you get angry and then you use the tools that you have to manage that anger and then you calm down and you're done. Right. It, but it, it is those four stages you old, like over and over and over again, mental health, physicality, learning how to ride, learning how to do anything. There's always those four stages. And so, yeah, like understand that those are wins. Each one of those different steps is a win, not a loss. The failures and the wins along the way yeah. to get us to a point of, I don't know if we want to look at it as a self mastery, but still, even in that last stage where you can get to stage four, like you just described, and you can have that opportunity to win whatever it is that you're trying to tackle and still trying to remember and stay humble and have failure be a part of it so that you can keep yourself open to getting the feedback, even in mastery is Let's not go down the path of, hey, step four is finally when you let the ego come in and ruin the party. That's not what this is about. Yeah. But well, that's yeah, usually, I absolutely have to agree. Then that stage four is like the beginning of another stage one, right? Like you, you, you figured that portion out. You're like, aha. And then you realize there's something else attached to it. And you're like, ah, shit. And you got to start over again. Yeah, it doesn't, it, it doesn't end there. Right, right? You exactly. keep going. It just, it, it morphs into something different, right? Yeah, but that's uh, the building We've block. covered so much. Yeah, man, absolutely. We've covered so much ground today. And I want to just quickly reflect on the person that, you know, obviously, we have had a chance to sit down here with. Chance, you've come so far in your own journey of having had gone through the military and now into fatherhood, uh, and raising young children and being there as a father and a husband and also on this journey of learning about yourself and the self-care needed to ensure that you stay well. Something that we didn't even get an opportunity to really dive into was, and I know you're very busy, but ensuring too, and we're worth it as men, to be able to take the time out of the day to daily self-care. Mm -hmm. And I know you're doing that because if you, if you weren't, you wouldn't be able to be where you're at right now, spreading the message of compassion and empathy and, and the connection that comes from this space. So I truly applaud you. And I mean, there's so many little gifts or tools, as you say, that you can take from this episode and put in your own toolbox. Now, the one thing I do want to say, and this is the beauty that's come from this space of just being connected with you, self-care as a man is so incredibly important. So please continue to look after yourself and connect with your brothers and tell them exactly where you're at. I loved your story about being in the bar and letting the, the podcast be born from the bar as many things are conceived from the bar, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. But having that real group of men in your in your tribe that you can be open with and have those hard conversations with and just show up and say yeah i'm struggling right now i'm going through x y and z whatever it is those invested men will help to ensure that they hold you accountable and you stay on the right path you need those type of people in your life so this this episode for me really transcends the normal PTSD. What is PTSD? How do we approach mental health? And you really touched on many different aspects of how do we continue to grow beyond the PTSD. So I just wanted to thank you for that chance. I mean, you absolutely nailed today and I couldn't be more excited to one, air this and then to two, come over and support you later on your podcast. And yeah, we're going right. to crush it out of the park over there and we're going to help you out as much as we can. So thank you for your time. Absolutely my pleasure, really is. Thank you for joining us on Season 2. If you are a first responder with an incredible story into post-traumatic stress, please reach out and connect with myself. Season 2 is based on your story. And if you want to step up to the plate and share your story with the world, I would be more than honored to help you do that. Thank you for your continued support with this project, and thank you for tuning in today.